Welcome to Math 20 in Week 9. We're looking at the calendar in the syllabus, about halfway down the page. And I wanted to point out that the fact that our final next week says it's Monday at 10 is completely garbage. That, that's just how things were scheduled, sort of officially assuming there was no distance learning. And that's not relevant to you at all. Um, there's nothing special about Monday at 10 in the morning. So don't show up for Zoom or things like that. So two things about the calendar. First, anytime people want study sessions this week or next week, let me know. And I had temporarily taken off the Friday one because I wasn't sure if we'd have it, but I'm happy to put it back. No one emailed with any suggestions of what they want more. So I'll actually make a note to myself. Might as well try that. I know at least some weeks people have showed up. So how the, this, this works is when you want a final, let me know. And then I will go to the um, practice tests and bring up a Math 20 final. And I will say show answers and I'll save a copy with the answers. And then I'll hide the answers and send you a copy without the answers. And then your job would be to take that, take pictures of it. Right? So you will send me something that looks more or, like, more or less like this, where you're just writing things on paper and sending me the pictures. And then I can grade it and tell you how you did. And if you get the grade you want, because the achievements have different grades based on how many stars you're trying to get and what letter grade you're trying to get. If you get as much as you want, then you're done. And whether that happens later today or on Friday the 12th at the very last minute of finals week, it's still there. If you don't get the grade you want, then try again. So if you haven't done lots of practice tests and are absolutely sure that you are as capable as you want to be for your grade, then don't wait until Friday the 12th, because then you only have that one chance. So as soon as you want, tell me you want a final, um, but take lots of practice finals first because then you can grade yourself and see how you're doing. And as I've mentioned down here, then here at the very bottom, then the wrong way to take a practice test is to go here and print one out and then sit down and try and do all 35 problems because you can't learn 35 things at once. So what you want to do is Print one out, right? have the answers ready so you can see them when you need to. And then work until there's one or two that are troublesome. And then stop and check your answers and see how you did. And then reload the page so all the numbers change. And then just try those troublesome one or two again. And once you've got them down, then move on and try the next few and keep going and say, oh, easy, easy, up. Oh, now here's a couple I'm struggling with. And only struggle with one or two at a time and just keep reloading the page after you grade yourself and only try and learn one or two things at a time. And finally, if you've done that a lot, you'll get all the way through the test and you'll know that you can do all of them. But don't make your first attempt at a practice final being try and do all of them. That would be silly. That's like trying to learn a complicated martial arts or skateboard routine all in one go. That's not how anything works for learning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Zoom record. It also mentions down here about oral exams. And especially with distance learning, this is useful because I wouldn't want anyone to be able to say your assessment was too wimpy. Everyone knows spring term 2020 was like fake school. All your tests were at home. All your tests had no time limit. That doesn't count for anything. And so I'm going to, after you turn one in and are happy with your grade, then we'll chat with phone or email and make an oral exam out of it. And it's only going to be probably five or 10 minutes, not a big deal, but I will be able to say, you got number three right, explain your steps. 
Or in number five, you made a careless mistake. Show me where it is. Or someone else tried number seven and made a mistake. Can you find where this pretend person didn't do it correct but made a mistake? And things like that. So I can look into your brain a little bit more than otherwise. And when I did this at the end of winter term, it also saved me a lot of um, asking people to do another version. That if you wanted to get whatever, 70% for your grade for the right stars of that, I'm not even sure that is a actual cutoff point. But if you wanted that percentage and you got just a tiny bit less, then I could have you fix a few problems on Zoom or by phone and then say, hey, okay, now you've gotten up to the 70, you fixed those problems. So it saved everyone a lot of time of having to do another entire version of the test. Because let's face it, that's 35 problems. There's plenty of space to make careless errors. I don't think I have ever gone in this class 35 problems in a row without one of you catching a careless mistake I make. So it will happen. That's okay. Other questions about how tests work or anything else as the term ends? The other thing was if you want more study sessions, I'm going to put one here on the 5th at 3.30 as usual. But if you want other study sessions happening, let me know because Otherwise, this week, even though it says the finals at 10, again, that doesn't mean anything. This week is just blank. I'm not planning on seeing you next week, which is silly. I should be having office hours and study sessions. Should we do the noon and two o'clock as usual on the 8th and 9th? Should we do 10 in the morning as usual on the 8th or the 10th? Eighth and the tenth, and what else? I don't know. Just yeah, it's it's more people will come if we plan in advance. So if you want me to say at ten in the morning we're having a study session because we're done with class, then I can. Yeah, I like that. I do. Monday the eighth at ten. Something we're used to doing. We won't forget. Okay. I probably won't do one at noon also then, because that would just be like all day when you should be doing practice tests, but that will give you time to ask questions. It might be nice to know that there is opportunity on the 10th, either at 10 or at two, at 12, that if there's been something that's, um, needing some answer and haven't had time to um, just to know that it's office hours or something. Okay, I can put something there too, then on Wednesday. Well, and that would I expect I will do a lot of very short one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings. Over both Saturday and Sunday, there was a time where one student, uh, once in Math 25 and then once in Math 20, just was like on Zoom with me for 10 minutes because he or she had a few questions and we got through that and then it was goodbye. So I assume there will be more of that as the practice tests happen where someone sends me an email saying, Can I you think do some something people quick? want it just as starts to achievements. Mm -hmm. Yes, remember you can always chat with each other. If you don't have contact information for each other, get that or ask me to help you get that. But you can earn stars working together and explaining things to each other and if you don't know how to use Zoom to start your own meeting, you could always just jump into this room because as you've seen, you can be here before me. It's just kind of there. It is even true that on the um, what do you call it? You can share screens and stuff so you can point out things to each other and hold up papers to your webcams and all the rest. As I mentioned early in class, if you're always doing homework alone, it's kind of like you're doing it wrong. 
sometimes that's what we have to do, but it's always better to be talking with other people when you get stuck. And practice tests are the same. At the end of class, I might want to schedule, is it okay to go through my achievements with you? Sure. Okay. At the end of class today, I'll probably need my 10 minute break to go make sure my kids are on task and warm up my tea again. But at noon, then we can. And yeah, any time today would work for me. Oh, okay, and I can always have other people, I, I can, um, Say, you know, everyone else come back in five minutes if they're here at noon and you want to talk grades. That works. Okay, homeworky questions. Now that we've talked about tests and schedules. Um, I had the uh, hardest questions. time doing number 10. For measurement? Um, Percentages. Uh, hold on, let me go back. Uh, fractions. Fractions, 10. Okay, well, let's do that. So homework, turn in. It was about the deer and the catch and release. Yes, of course we're going to do that one. That's the worst problem in all of Math 20. I think that's the one problem I might have gotten wrong. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's sure. start that one. So we mentioned this last class, but didn't solve it. And I said that this is going to be the worst problem ever because our normal process doesn't work. So let me actually move this just to, for people who we're absent for, I don't want to start with that one. So let's start with, number four. So first we'll do a normal one and then we'll do the hard one. And then I can better talk about what makes the hard one hard. Sound good? So when we are solving these proportion problems, how we normally want to do things is we look at the problem and we're reading it because in real life, it doesn't come with a label saying proportion problem. And we say, ah, here is one situation and I know two numbers and they are a rate, they're a comparison. Every 4.5 gallons of gas, I can go 120 miles. And then we have another situation that's parallel to it we have this many gallons and how many miles. So we have four numbers, but we only know three of them and they're in two symmetrical situations. Aha, that's what I do with a proportion. So we draw the shape of our proportion and I start reading the problem again. Julia's car can drive 120 miles on 4.5 gallons of gas. And then I stop reading the problem because I don't care what it says in the rest. I know that if miles is on the top once, miles has to be on the top again. And if gallons is on the bottom, then gallons has to be on the bottom again. And that way, if they try and trick us and they switch from miles to feet, or there's something with time and they switch from minutes to hours or something like that, I will notice, aha, you're trying to trick me because these words have to match. In this case, there's nothing tricky. It's just gallons and we're looking for miles. So I have one situation here. And another situation here. And then 
Both of these are miles. And both of those are gallons. So I'm really emphasizing this because in the next problem, it's going to be dysfunctional. Once I have that, then I can cross multiply. Y time is 4.5 is 120 times 0.9. is get y by itself the opposite of times 4.5 is divided by 4.5 24 miles 24 miles <laughs> Everyone okay with the sort of straightforward version of these proportion problems? Yeah. Okay. So now back to the one you really asked. We want the same stuff happening where we have one situation on one side, the other situation on the other, the labels on the top stay the same, the labels on the bottom stay the same. So, do 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 do. To determine the number of deer in a game preserve, a forest ranger catches and tags and releases 318 deer. Later, he catches 168 deer and sees that 56 of them are tagged. So use a proportion to estimate the number of deer in the game preserve. Actually, I'm going to make these lines longer. So what happens to almost everybody, or maybe even everybody when they try this, is you can't just put the word deer everywhere. Because that gives you zero guidance about which is one situation and which is the other. And it gives you zero guidance about am I putting numbers on the top or the bottom correctly. So we need longer labels than just a deer. We need something like total or caught care. or tagged or something like that. I don't care what you do, just, just help me protect so what's our, what are the two situations we're looking at? Even that is not obvious. So the 318, they caught and released and tagged the deer. Right. We have, th we have three numbers and four spots, so we have to put those three numbers somewhere. It's just not obvious which ones go where. Wouldn't that go in the partial number? The 318? Yeah. I can try that. So if, let's put the 318 in one of our kind of partial numbers. How should I label that? I would, I would probably put partial deer. <laughs> I'm not sure partial is the most meaningful. Um, released. Released. Yeah. Caught. They could be, we could call them caught because they all have been caught. We could call them tagged because they all have been tagged. We could call them released because they all have been released. I'm not sure which of these words is the best yet. Okay. And wouldn't Y be what we're looking for, like the total estimate of the total number of deer? Yeah, so Y is the total in the preserve. And the fact that I'm writing in the preserve is a hint that that's something I should also write here. That's my second situation, preserve. So situation two, Let's see if I can write legibly. Okay, so we're halfway done. We know what the second thing is. 
What's the first situation? A hundred and sixty eight deer pop. There's one hundred and sixty eight, and there's a fifty six. Would fifty six be like the percent, like part of it, part of the so the left pop? Yes. I wouldn't say percent, but there, you have an intuition after Math 20 that this is sort of like a part out of a whole, which yeah. we could make a percent, but we're not going to. And so this 168 is the, we want the word total to match this word total, but the situation isn't the whole preserve. This is the total in the second catching, right? So that's one reason this problem seems so counterintuitive, is that what we call our first situation is the second thing chronologically. It's the second time we're catching deer. There is a situation chronologically where he catches a bunch of deer and tags all of them. There's a 318 over 318, but that's not a useful one to look at. And then we can finish up. We see that 56 is tagged. So that's the word we're looking for, but not sure about. So we've done what we're trying to do. We have one word at the top. We have a different word at the bottom one side of the equation is one situation, the second time he caught deer. The other side of the equation is its own situation, the whole game preserve, what's happening. So then we would multiply the 318 by the 168. Yeah, now it's just an easy problem. Y times 56 equals 168 times 318. 53,424 is what I got. 53,424. I divide both sides by 56. What's my answer? 954. 954 deer, oh, okay. Does that seem reasonable? When he caught them the second time, about a third of them are tagged, right? It's about 50 over 150, not quite. But. So now the second time, about a third of them are tagged. So yeah, about 900 compared to 300. I don't know how I got that wrong. Well, what almost everyone does is they try and start it with saying that this side of the equation will be the first catch. And this side will be the second time he caught a bunch of deer is that seems to make sense. Most of these have like the first thing chronologically that happens and the second thing that happens. But when you try that, you have, well, all of them are tagged. And then like 56 of them are tagged or something like that and nothing works well. There's no room for why. And then you think, well, that can't work because there's no room for why, and you're not sure what to go on from there. So.
the way we have it set up, <clears throat> could we just flip flop the, all the numbers and the situations so that you still have the um, 318 over Y being on the left side? Yeah, you can always write one of these on the other side and then flip it back here, right? If two things are equal, it doesn't matter which side they're on. Right, okay. Okay, good question. Other homework questions while we're here? We've done a lot of those. Oops. I did fix these problems as I promised, so. So is the percentage in the measurement due yet? Nope, because we had questions about it last time. Is the fractions one due? Uh, is the fractions one due? I'm not sure. Let's look and see. This is a measurement of mad science. Percentages of, no, it looks like nothing from justice has a due date yet. Which is fine, because again, the only point is if you have too many late ones, then that's fine. So, can't be late if they have no due date, just get them in eventually. Does no one have a, does anyone have a question on the percentages? I don't think I've even started that yet. That tends to be much easier than what we just did. I did mine. I just have to turn it in. I don't think I have any questions. Okay, well then let's keep going with the last of our stuff. So we've talked about geometry. We either folded paper or you watched me fold paper to figure out why these different formulas work. Area of a rectangle is length times width. Area of a parallelogram is also that, except we call it base times height. Area of a triangle is one half base times height because we're cutting our parallelogram in two. Um, trapezoid, you averaged the top and bottom and then multiplied that by the height. So we've mentioned all those before. So now we're doing something, oops, I should make this a little bigger, more interesting. So if we want to find the perimeter and area of this shape, then we have a little bit of work to do. Whoops. So before I say go and I'll catch up to you, then how big is A and how do you know? You would add four and two. Yeah, if I start going here, that's two. And then I keep going here, that's four. And together those make up this one. So A is six. How about B? One and a half, take the one and the two and a half. So this side is two and a half. And then we're going to take away the one and we get left one and a half. 
everyone happy with that? So that's the first type of sort of puzzle thinking with these area and perimeter problems is sometimes I have to look at what's happening on the opposite side of my shape to get some missing numbers. Okay, now find the perimeter and the area. And you do it for a moment and then I will do it. Which corner did people start at as we're walking around the shape for perimeter? I started with the one. Like this top corner? Yeah. Yeah. So wherever you start, it's helpful to sort of mark that. It's a common thing to do on a test when your brain is fried is to forget where you started and double count something or not finish. So this one was six, and this one was 1.5. So we had six, and then 2.5, and four, and 1.5, and two, and one. And that should be a plus. And you might notice, by the way, that this is just six twice, and this is just two and a half twice. I can imagine I'm like pulling this corner over here to making a rectangle out of it. So I'm going to get 12 and five is 17, but you could also just add them all up. How about the area? How did people find the area? You do six times 2.5. So if we do six times 2.5, then That gives me the whole rectangle. So I'm going to write that in green. So we have the area of the big rectangle, which is going to be a length times width, which is going to be a 6 times 2.5 that look like multiplying. Okay, now we have too much area because we don't want that bottom corner. What do I do to finish up? because right now my answer is too big. You have to figure out the missing part. This, of this one, yeah. This one I need to get rid of, right? So I'm going to subtract away. Oops. The 
the area of the little rectangle, which is also a length times width, which is a two times a 1.5. So we're going to get six times two and a half would give me six and six is 12 and three more is 15. Two times one and a half is three. So we'll get 12 square inches. So that's how most people do it. You are saying, I'm going to find something that's too big and then subtract away the piece that's not there. Other people might have tried it by saying, I'm gonna chop the piece into two different rectangles and I will find length times width for each of them and add them up. And that works too. Fewer people pick this, but it's fine. Almost never do I find someone whose brain likes saying, I want to chop them in two different rectangles this way and do length times width for each of them and add them up. But if you wanted to, you could do it that way. I just don't see it as what works naturally for people. The three steps I wrote will seem like too much, but I encourage you as you're starting on these and doing homework to write these steps. My first step is the make a plan. And this plan has no formulas and no numbers. I'm just telling myself in whatever shorthand, I like subscript, but you can do whatever you want, mm -hmm. that I'm gonna take these pieces and add them up or I'm gonna take those pieces and subtract them, something like that. Then step two you're going to put in formulas. Wherever your plan has a rectangle, that's length times width. Wherever it has a triangle, that's one half base times height and so on. And then step three is to put in the numbers in the formula. And this might be extra writing for some of these you feel like you don't need to do it. But as I've emphasized before, it's just nice to be reliable and have a step that keeps you from making careless mistakes. So I'm going to write things this way as we do more problems. If you think I'm writing too much, that's okay, but this is why I'm doing it. Okay, what's the area of this house kind of shape? What's my plan going to be? We have to figure out what the width is first, don't we? The width is 10, we know that. Don't worry about the numbers yet. Just very simple, what am I doing with my shapes to find the total area? Find the area of the box, find the area of the triangle separate and add them together. And add them together. So I'm gonna have a box and I'm going to add them, add it to the triangle.
So this is going to be a length times a width. And this one is going to be a one half base times height. Okay, for the box, do I know the length and width? Yeah, one side is 10 and the other side is 12. And if it helps, you could put 10 inches down here also. For the triangle, do I know the base and the height? Well, the base is 10. What's my height going to be? Eight. Eight six, I'm six, I'm sorry. Six. Yeah. Everyone see six, 18 minus 12. Notice that if I wasn't sure which sides to measure, Writing the formulas helps me say, ah, oh, I need to find the base. There it is. I need to find the height. There it is. So the formula step is your reminder about here's what I need to look for in the picture. Okay, so we have 120 plus 5 times 6 is 30. So 150. And this time it's square inches. Questions about that one? Okay. So as a warning, what's the area of this square? Sixteen. Sixteen, right? Like times width is four times four. How about this square? 16. 16 is the same square. There are a few people that when they see too many things labeled, they get all confused. And they either start adding things up because it looks like a perimeter problem, even though it asked for the area, or they get flustered in some other way. So sometimes people are mean and they label too many things and that's okay. Just find the things you need to plug into your formula and ignore the other numbers. So we have a staircase. The big triangle is six centimeters on the side. Each of the little steps has a height and base of one because there's six of them, so that makes it fit. 
So what would we do here? Wouldn't you just uh, count all the little stairs, add them up uh, centimeters? So here's a little shape. Actually, let me use my highlighter. So I have six of those. That'd be six centimeters. And then I also have my big triangle, right? So it's going to be one big triangle plus scoop it over. six times a little red upside down triangle. Everyone okay with my plan? So in my next step, wherever I see a shape, I'm going to put in the formula. So for the green triangle, the base and the height are both six. For the little red triangle, the base and the height are both one. So they are not one, cent one square centimeter each. They're actually one half square centimeter each. We've talked about terms. You might notice that each part of my plan is its own term. You don't really care. Your calculator is going to do this all in one step anyway, but it is a thematic thing that links back to what we've done. So one half times six times six, which is three times six. So that's going to be 18. One half times one times one, that's just a half. So 18 plus half of six, 18 plus three is 21 square centimeters. Seems familiar. Did we have a 21 before? No, we had a 12. Okay. Before we move on, I want to point out three different kinds of numbers. There are like different flavors or different food groups or something. This six is here because we have one, two, three, four, five, six little triangles. It's a number that's there because of the drawing. There's nothing triangle-ish about the number six. There's nothing that was measured as the number six. It was that we physically had six photocopies of this little triangle. So some numbers you'll have just because that's how the picture has that many pieces. The one halves are there because of the formula. That's from the triangle formula. Nothing was measured to be one half. It's not like we had half of a shape. This is just a formula number. And then these sixes and these ones, they were things that were actually measured on the shape. So might be a little confusing, but it might help you to think about how there's three actually different kinds of numbers, just photocopy kind of numbers, formula kind of numbers, and someone took a ruler and measured things kind of numbers.
Oh, okay. One more. We need to pour some cement for a sidewalk. Somebody measured the building. The building is 110 by 72. And the sidewalk is 3.4 feet, 3 feet. So that makes, this makes the 110 into 113.4. And this width makes the 72 a little bit wider into 75.4. So how much area is the sidewalk on the two sides of the building? If you were stuck, then if we were just, oops, actually, inside, to stare from the top, like a bird's eye view of the footprint, then that's what it would be. Does that picture help more? What is someone's plan that I can write down? Would it be uh, area is length times width? That's the second line. I don't want formulas yet. I just was want something about like oh, rectangles so it, or So it's be like the square plus the square? You could add up pieces. Some people do that. They have one rectangle here and one rectangle here and a little square in the corner, or they have one rectangle and then a bigger one that includes the corner, or maybe it's the other way. So some people do add up two or three pieces, and I can do that if that's the way people want. What's a different way that people got the purple area? Can you use the, can you use a triangle, use the angle the, as a right triangle? Triangles are going to make me have more work than I want. So I give up. I don't know. Is it going to be the... Uh, smaller uh, square or the smaller rectangle from the larger rectangle? Yeah, the other way to do this is to find the whole big rectangle and then say I'm going to subtract from that the smaller rectangle and what's left is the outside edge. That also involves finding two rectangles. So it's not like one of these is faster or better than another. So I'd rather only do it once. I can do this more than once if people want. Which should we do? Should we add up bits of sidewalk or should we take away the building from the whole footprint? Take away the building. Everyone okay with that one? So we have I don't have purple as a marker option. So we have the big entire footprint and then we're going to subtract away the green building part.
So this is a length times width. This one is also a length times width. This one is 113.4 times 75.4. one is 110 times 72. And if my calculator does all that, what do I get? Six thirty point three six. In real life, I'd probably round this. If I am trying to buy cement or something, then I'm not going to care about it to the hundredth of a square foot. We don't really know it that well. So if you like these kinds of things, there is a Twitter account by Katriona Schreerer, if I'm pronouncing her name right. And she has all sorts of these kinds of things that you can torture your friends and family with. If you want the ones that only have rectangles, then um, oh, there's a website that has a whole bunch of those, um, Naoki Inaba, and he also made a book of them. But enough of that. Okay, our last topic is variables and negatives. And just like we started justice by doing one and two step equations, and I warned you that two step equations we don't need. Everything with proportions made a one step equation. Everything with percent sentences made a one step equation. But we did some two step equations partly so that you could recognize when you see them they have a minus y or a divided by y on one side. And also a sort of a heads up of math 60, that now your first week of math 60 will be much easier. So same thing with variables and negatives. We don't care about variables and negatives in math 20, in the sense we're about to talk about them. Real life doesn't tend to have a lot of negative numbers, whether you're in baking or nursing or carpentry or whatever, things just tend to have positive numbers. But we want to talk about them a little bit, just so that in the beginning of Math 60, you don't get surprised by things. And there's kind of one main lesson that we want to stick into your brain as Math 20 teachers. So this page numbers jump all over because most tech books, textbooks include some negative numbers as you go, but we don't, we don't care. So negative numbers are less than zero. We could draw a number line. You've probably done this since elementary school. Negative five is less than negative two. And even though five is more than two, it's still that if I owe someone five bucks, that's worse than if I owe someone two bucks. You can keep track of decimals on a number line also. 2.8, I would go down one, two, and then almost to three. Or positive 3.5, I would count one, two, three, and then get halfway to four. So hopefully this is all review. And if you haven't used number lines, or if you haven't since you were a wee little kid, that's okay. We don't really care. The first moral is that to add and subtract, it's helpful to think of money. A positive number is like how much money is in your hand that you can spend, and a negative number is like a debt that you've promised to pay. And this lets you make stories to help when you have negative numbers. 
So if I want 30 plus negative 12, we can think I have $30 in my hand. I'm heading out to go shopping. I have added a debt of negative 12. I owe one of my friends 12 bucks. So in my mind, I should shop as if I only had 18, because 12 of those dollars aren't mine to spend. So 30 plus a debt of 12, I really only have $18. How about 18 minus a negative 12? We could make a story for that also. I'm about to go shopping. I have $18 in my hand. I owe my friend $12. There's this debt there. I have that debt with me. I want to visit my friend's house and pay him the 12 bucks. When I finally see my friend, he says, never mind the debt. So we're subtracting away the debt. It's been seven years just to keep the 12. So now I have the 18 that I considered my money in my hand. And I have the 12 I was about to hand it to him. So I have both of that. So I add them up and I get 30. So that helps you realize that subtracting a debt is a positive. It gives you the money that you were going to hand to your friend to pay off the debt. You can also use a number line. So if those stories don't work for you and they don't work for everybody, then you can say, ah, I'm going to start at four then I go down six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So at this point I'm at negative two. Then I'm going to add a debt of three. So one, two, three. Now I'm at negative five. Then I'm gonna cancel out a debt of 10. So that goes up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Now I'm at five. And then I'm going to go back down two, and I wind up at three. So maybe that rings a bell from years and years ago. But even that we don't really care about. So remember 18 minus negative 12 is 30. Subtracting away a negative worked like adding. Because I have more money, whether I get paid a positive amount, or whether someone cancels my debt and I can go, yay, now that's my money. So there's a saying that says a negative of a negative is a positive when you multiply negative numbers. So why would that be true? Imagine that we have our number line. And in a normal class, I would just have someone come to the front of the room and actually walk around, but we we're just going to do this with pictures. We've already done this with Peter Rabbit a long time ago. If I have someone facing the positive way and we want to say, show me negative three, they could back up. Oh, I bet I can even kind of animate this. Okay, so I can take my little person and if I want to say, show me negative three, then they could back up three and be at negative three. Or if I want to say, show me negative three, they could turn around. And then walk forward three. One, two, three, and they'd be at negative three. So one way to do negative was to back up. Another way was to do an about face and go forward. And if you have a negative of a negative, then both of those happen. So you start out facing forward. You do, whoops, you do your about face, but then you back up because that was the other way. And you wind up at positive three. So a negative of a negative is a positive. If you do an about face and back up, you get to a positive number. But even that isn't what we really care about. Big warning for Math 60 is consider the expression 10 minus x. If we plug in x equals 20, 
then I have 10 bucks and I take away $20 and now I'm in debt $10. It's a negative number. If I put in X is negative 20, then 10 minus X becomes I have $10 and I'm subtracting a debt of 20. So now I'm getting bigger, I'm at positive 30. So is 10 minus X positive or negative? It isn't either of those. It depends on what you plug in. And in general, that's true for any variable. X isn't positive or negative. If I put in plus three, X is positive. If I put in minus three, X is negative. So the big thing we want to leave you with, stick in your brain if you're going into math 20, is that we're used to thinking that a number is either positive or negative, but we can't do that with variables. Whenever you see a variable in math 60, you're not sure if it's positive or negative. It depends on what you plug in it. So that's why in college math, we write subtraction symbol instead of the little floating negative that some people use in elementary school, because the floating negative just means this number is negative. And with variables, we're not sure. So we need the symbol that says whatever this number is, we're subtracting it, which might make things smaller or it might make things bigger. And that's all we really care about. So get that warning in your brain. I'm not sure if there actually is any homework about negatives. Let's look and see. No, we don't give you any homework about it. We just want you to be, have a heads up that when you go into math 60 and you see a variable, then maybe it's positive or maybe it's negative. We are not sure yet. Does the practice test have any I don't see any negatives there. There is one that's a slightly more complicated two-step problem, but it doesn't have negatives. Okay, and that's it. Congratulations. You're all done with new stuff in Math 20. Now it's just review and practice. Yay. Can we do some problems like that one you just showed us on the test? This one? Sure. I don't like the period at the end. I should get rid of that. Uh -huh. So this is a different kind of two-step problem, an easier kind of two-step problem than what we've done before. So someone has nine W's and someone else has three W's and we want all the W's together. So if we do something to one side of the equation, we have to do it to the other how can I just get rid of these three W's? You can add it to the other side. Yeah. Well, I actually subtract it on both sides. If I take away three W's on one side of the equation to get rid of them, I have to also take away three W's from the other side. So I have six of the W's left from here, none there. And now this is what I'm used to. I often might write this as six times W is 24, but it's just something attached to my number, a number attached to my letter. Now I can do the opposite. Opposite of times six is divided by six.
So I get my W is four. If you're used to six W is the same as six times W, great, but I'm not sure everyone in Math 20 is used to that. So there's two things here as Math 60 heads up. One is get rid of the smaller pile of variable. And then the other thing is that 6w means times. Not sure why that looks so bad. Should we do another one? Sure. Okay, so we don't know, maybe W is like a box of cookies. We don't know how many are in the box yet. Debbie has 12 boxes of cookies. Spring has four boxes of cookies and 48 cookies. We know they have the same amount overall. So how many cookies are in a box? Well, we're going to have Christina come by and steal the four boxes from spring, and she's also, to be fair, going to steal the four, four of the 12 boxes that Debbie has. Debbie is left with eight boxes of cookies. Spring is only left with her 48 on a tray. Did that story help? I don't know. Anyway. Opposite of times eight is divided by eight. And so each box had six in it. If you don't want to do these, that's okay. You don't need to get 100% on the test. This is sort of a hoop to make you jump through at the very end of Math 20 if you're going into Math 60 to make your first week or two of Math 60 easier. Should make that eight look like an eight. Huh? Hey David, can I ask you a question? Sure. At the beginning of class, when we were talking about the deer, mm -hmm. we were doing those deer problems. Um, and we'd set it up where you cross multiplied. Could we have used that sentence formula or did we have to set it up in a cross multiply? Ah, that's a good compare contrast. So if I'm looking at the practice test, then one kind of thing we do is a little. Uh, I actually want a turn in problem. Not measurement. Okay, excellent, excellent question. So there's that one, and there's Oh, 
Okay. So in this top problem, uh, actually, let me switch the order of them because that's the way you asked it and that's the way things happened in class. So in this one, we have four numbers involved. We know three of the numbers. And then there's two situations. So we have to set that one up as a proportion. The first situation is that in 2,941 ounces, there's 34 milligrams of medicine. We want 5.7 milligrams of medicine. So how many ounces do we feed the dinosaur? Everyone okay with that so far? That's like the deer one. Right? When you were talking about the fill in the blank ones, that was the percent word problems. There was that blank for people who liked translating. And then there was that blank for people who liked proportions. And that one has three numbers. We know two of them. And there's only one situation happening. So I could either go blank is blank percent of something. So 35 is what percent of 45. Or I could set up the proportion, the percent out of 100 is the part over the whole, as we talked about before. So percent sentences involve only three numbers, and they're just one situation. Proportion problems involve four numbers, but we only know three of them, and we have a situation on the left and a different situation on the right. By the way, this car problem is tricky. I don't think we've done it yet this term. Have we done 31? No, we haven't done that one. And thank you for explaining that other thing because I definitely was mixing up the proportion uh, because of the word proportion, like it's in both of, I have it written in my notes, the proportion method, and then, um, and then the percent sentences. So I definitely mix those two up um, as I was watching this morning. So, oh, okay. I mean, it's clear, it's more clear, I should say. Now, still a little fuzzy, but. You could think of it that the problem here just has one situation. So to use a proportion, we need to create a second situation. And we do that by saying that situation is the percent, some number over 100. That gives us a second situation to compare with the part over whole. Okay. So that sentence, and that, so the sentence that I, you know, I like to use the sentence for some reason, and that would absolutely not work with the top problem. Right. Here you only have three blanks. If you plugged in three numbers, you'd have nowhere for your Y. Whereas the second, the Y over 100 and 35 over 45, that works for both the top problem and the bottom problem. 
but differently because this one again you need to make sure your words match whereas in this one you're plugging things in to the different parts so okay. your setup has a completely different way of thinking okay all right thank you i appreciate that you're welcome Okay, so this one is also tricky. It is top or bottom. What kind of thing is it? I want to say bottom, but. Yeah, it has only three numbers. Two of them we know. It's all one situation. So this is a percent sentence. So I'm going to grab this thing or this thing. So two ways of doing it. Right? Why don't we put them at the bottom? Because you don't like when I draw at the bottom. So. I'm going to do something like blank is blank percent of blank. And I should probably set this up for the proportion method on the next slide. Okay, there we go not fit too much on the board. So the problem here is my numbers don't match. If I draw my circle, then there's a 24%. So there's that. And that's how much the car depreciates. That value of the car goes away. We're also told that after that part goes away, what's left is 15,000. So that's the other part of the pie. So I can't plug in a 24% here and a 15,000 in either place because one of those numbers is about the green part of the pie and the other number is about the blue part of the pie and they don't match. Do, can I put a dollar amount for the blue part of the pie? No, I don't know what that is yet. Can I put a percentage amount for the green part of the pie? Yeah, I yeah. can say that 100% minus the 24% is going to be 76%. So now I have a percent and a dollar amount that go with the same part of the pie. So at this point, I'm going to take the blue part and say, I'm forgetting about it. It is now a distraction. I have used that information as much as I want. I'm now just saying that 15,000 that's the part, the new amount is 76% of what entire pie? Then if you translate things, is becomes equals, we'll do our riplop, of becomes multiply. There's something stuck onto y with multiply, so I'll divide by that 0.76.
and I would get 15,000 divided by There we go. What almost everybody does the first time they see this problem is they try and take 24% of 15,000. And if I was to draw that on the picture, that would be saying, let's take the green part of the pie and find a quarter of that. But that's a pizza wedge that doesn't mean anything at all. If we were a proportion method person, I would think exactly the same thing. And then, oops, I would set up my proportion with the 76, the 100, the part is the 15,000. whole amount, I don't know. That would be the whole pi. And I would cross multiply and keep going. As a side note, problems like that are tricky on purpose, and that is to help you have an easier time later on in life. Every now and then I will give either a Math 20 practice finals from other classes to my class, and everyone says, oh, this is so much easier, or I will give these to other teachers to give to their classes in Math 20, and their students get very confused not having seen that kind of thing before. So you will leave at the top of Math 20 with a slightly harder test than other people. One question that everyone would have is there's 35 problems. Let's say I'm going for just a plain A in the class, not a plus. So I need 66% on the final to get an A. So how many problems do I need to get right on the final? So I am asking, Is it 35 is 66 percent of what, or is it what is 66 percent of 35? Sixty-six percent of is, 35. Yeah, 35 is the whole, the total. So that goes in this one, and we want what part do we need? So this is the part. So translate is becomes equals. 0.66 with Riplop, of becomes multiply, and 
whatever that is. So about 23. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, when taking the practice test, your job is to try and learn one or two at a time. And when you can repeat that process and get through 23 problems reliably, then you might be ready to send me an email and say, okay, I need one to actually try taking for a grade. I'm ready for my first serious attempt. You don't have to master 35 of them. Will we have any due dates for the um, justice unit for homework? Um, no, because we won't have any official classes to turn things in. So the justice you will need to turn in to get the stars for it to get 10 homeworks. And everyone also saw that to get an A you need 10 homeworks for the class topics. So if you look down at the homeworks, then we have for things that count as topics, which includes the reflection and the CLO, then there's 12 things. So you get to skip two of them. So you'll need to turn them in, but there won't be a way to be late on the ones that are from the justice section. So do you still have to do the CLO? Uh, you have to do section? 10 of the, you have to do 10 of these oh. 12. So if you do all of the ones that are homework codes, then that's 10 of those and you don't have to do the top two here. If you've done the reflections, then you can skip a code for each reflection you've done. Or if you do everything that helps you get the nine extra stars that I don't need to get a plus after your grade. Okay, I'm going to stop recording because I think we're slowing down, but I am going to keep it with questions.